I've already mentioned to the auditorium class this morning something about the theme or the topic that I'll be addressing. And I will now go ahead and just put it into a question. Are we hereditarily totally depraved? Now, there are a host of people who claim Jesus as their Savior, and the Bible is the Word of God, who believe they are hereditarily totally depraved. If you consult a great many commentaries that are quite good in a lot of ways, but they come from writers, quite scholarly and quite learned, but who are hung up, and that's the way I'll put it, in the doctrine of Calvin, then you're going to see that they will view a great many things from the standpoint, that is, man's problems, why they exist, from the standpoint of he's totally depraved. So it affects people in lots of ways. There are a lot of folks out there that would not hold tenaciously and logically and completely to the whole uh, scheme, uh, theology, system of Calvinism. But they have parts of it. And they have different views even of hereditary total depravity. But they all believe in some way that man is inclined to no good thing at all because he inherited the sin that Adam actually committed back there in the garden. Now let's look at this just for a while and, and we'll begin by defining these terms as to what they actually mean. It helps us in trying to study with people to convert them by the pure gospel of Jesus Christ to the truth of New Testament Christianity to understand their background, their idea. Now, I realize there are a lot of folks today in denominationalism who don't even know they are what they are. But there are still a great many who do. And if they do study the viewpoint that they have, or sort of the Bible in the light of it, then they're going to have some of this false doctrine in their thinking. First of all, the word hereditarily, hereditarily, it simply means by inheritance, by right of descent. Now you can consult any reputable dictionary and you'll see basically that definition of hereditarily, by inheritance, by right of descent. When you look at the word totally, totally, it means wholly, it means entirely, it means fully, it means completely. And again, if you will consult any reputable good dictionary, then you'll see it will have that basic definition, wholly, entirely, fully, and completely, to define totally. So there's hereditarily and totally, and now depraved. Depraved has to do with made bad or worse, tainted, corrupted. And a second uh, definition is corrupt, wicked, destitute of holiness or good principles. Consult Webster or any of these other dictionaries for the English meanings of these words hereditarily totally depraved. So what we are studying when we ask the question, are we hereditarily totally depraved, is are we by inheritance, by right of the descent, wholly, entirely, fully, and completely corrupted, made wicked, destitute of wholeness or good principles? That's the question using the definition for the terms in the question. Well, of course, we want to go to the Bible and uh, do our best to do as Paul said to Timothy, to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling a right, as the American Standard 1901 says, the word of truth. Remember, Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
Jesus in his prayer in John 17, 17 said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. That's why we preach the word, because we preach the truth concerning the salvation of man and all things spiritual. So let's keep in mind then that the question is, are we by inheritance entirely or fully or completely corrupted, tainted, made wicked? Well, in Acts 17 and verse 29, Acts 17, 29, we find Luke recording this. And as he does, he's recording part of the sermon Paul was preaching on Mars Hill in Athens. And he declares plainly that we human beings are the offspring of God. Now remember the question we're asking, the definitions. And we're talking about what we have received according to that question in our depravity is inherited. But Paul says we're the offspring of God. They say we've inherited something, but Paul says we are the offspring of God. Now wouldn't you think we've inherited what we've inherited from God since we are the offspring of God? Now notice, for as much then as we are the offspring of God. Can't get any plainer than that. We are or we aren't. He said we were. That's the Holy Spirit through him preaching. That's an apostle statement. Luke Bain's Spiration recorded it. I just believe he told the truth in the Word of God. That's a positive statement. We are the offspring of God. Certainly, in case somebody thinks this way, he's not talking about the body, the body of this flesh. That's the offspring of God. God doesn't have a fleshly body. God is spirit. Well, are, are you ready to insist then that the spirit comes from God? Well, I would. But if you take the position you've got with the offspring of God and we're hereditarily totally depraved, and hereditary means we get it from our ancestors, but with the offspring of God, it must mean that we're willing by implication to declare God's depraved. Now, who wants to be guilty of that heinous and terrible blasphemy? Notice what is said by the writer of Hebrews regarding our inward man or our spirits, the real you that dwells in this body, the center of your being, your actual being. Notice Hebrews 12 and verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of the flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Now watch. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Now who is the Father of the spirit that's within your mortal body at this time? Well, it sounds like to me the writer of Hebrews. You know, he's inspired by the same Holy Spirit that caused Luke to write down what the Apostle Paul said. Holy Spirit's pretty well involved in this. And he said that... Um, God fathers our spirits, and Paul said, we're the offspring of God. All right, if we inherit what we inherit from the one who gives us what we are physically, as well as what we are in our spirits, and we're declaring that we are hereditarily totally depraved, and that has nothing to do with our fleshly body, again, it goes back on God. Now, we shouldn't be surprised about this because, you know, that's what Satan wants to do. Whatever Satan does to destroy your soul, it's going to reflect on God. If you want to see just how he is in a direct conversation between God and Satan, go back to Job in the first couple of chapters and read God calling Satan's attention to Job and pointing out that Job was a righteous man. A righteous man. Nobody, on him, nobody on the earth liked Job. And what does Satan say? Yeah, that's right. You're God, and he's one of the few on earth that acknowledge you as God and submits to you in everything. He said, well, yes, he does acknowledge you as God, but not because you're God. You've paid him by blessing him everywhere under the sun. And the devil's attitude was take that away, and he'll deny you. And that tells us a lot about how Satan thinks. So here in this passage, Hebrews 12, 9, the father of the flesh is actually contrasted with the father of the spirit. Again, we, the spirit, are the offspring of God. We 
have a father of our spirits even as we have a father of our flesh. Now God's the father of the spirit. So it automatically raises the question, is God the father of a totally depraved spirit? If it is, whose fault is it? Then notice too, and it corroborates the other two verses, Hebrews 12, 9, Acts 17, 29, that God is the one who gives us our human spirits. In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, concerning the death of a person, it says, plainly, then shall the dust, that's what our mortal bodies are made of, our flesh is made of, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So we have the mark on our inward man upon our spirit. The mark or if you please, to use this terminology, the inheritance of God. And yet, what we've done, and the Bible is completely in harmony with this, we've shown how that man bears the stamp of God's morality. Why, even we pointed out to atheists that man has within himself a sense of oughtness. That is, a thing ought to be done a certain way or it ought not to be done a certain way. Now, as to how it ought to be done or ought not to be done depends upon your education in the Word of God to what's right and wrong. But you know, the Bible could teach us all day long. And if I didn't have built within my inward man, my spirit, that sense of oughtness, I wouldn't appreciate it. So you see, man, God had to make us, create us, in such a way is that we could be taught, we could be informed, we could be persuaded, we could reason. And in giving us the great gospel of Jesus Christ, in communicating with us the whole scheme of redemption, if you please, in giving us the whole Bible, He has not stepped around the way He made us to come to understanding anything. So the Bible is, if you please, fitted to man as God made man. Well, think about for a moment the fleshly appetites, if you please, or senses. If I want to know how something tastes, and if your taster still works better than mine, <laughs> then I have taste of it. But what if you don't, you, you can't taste anything? Nothing. Well, how are you going to taste it, no matter how good it is? Well, all right, there's certain things we feel of. And through life, we learn certain things have a certain feeling. And we'll ask, what does it feel like? Sometimes we say that regarding emotional or mental things, but I now speak of the sense of touch. Well, if you, if you can't, feel anything, if you do not have the sense of touch, no matter how well a thing may quote, quote, feel to your sense of touch, you won't know it. Can't do it. So God had to create our inward man, even as our outward man, so that information, truth, could get into that brain into the very depths of man's mind that goes certainly beyond the brain, for that's a part of your inward man or spirit, so that you could understand those things. Now, if I've never known of a person being this way. What if you couldn't see a thing, you couldn't hear a thing, you couldn't smell a thing, you couldn't taste a thing, you couldn't feel a thing, you don't have the sense of touch? Let me ask you this. How would you communicate with that person? Because every way you think about communicating to them is going to involve one or a combination of those senses. Now you might be blind, deaf, and dumb. That's Helen Keller. And you can still be communicated with. But look at the ordeal. If you ever read about her life, what they went through to, to do what they had to do to communicate with her, and for her to tune in on what senses she had that worked to take the place of the others. But if you don't have any of those senses, tell me how, first of all, you would know anybody exists beside you. How would you communicate? 
So it's obvious then that if you're talking about the Spirit and we are the offspring of God, He's the Father of our spirits, He has given us our spirit, then the imprint of God's born our spirits. But if we're born hereditarily totally depraved, and hereditarily means we have received from the one who preceded us or went before us. If that's happened, like we get our color of our eyes, color of our hair, and our statue, and so forth, genetically, physically, from our parents, then in the spirit, the inward spirit, that which is not fleshly, physical, or material, but we bear the imprint of God, but we're hereditarily totally depraved, we must inherit our depravity from God. There's no getting around it. That's just logically taking their doctrine and saying that fits with the revealed mind of God if you're going to interpret it that way, which is a wrong interpretation starting from a false premise. It's interesting to note that Jesus said in his earthly ministry in preparing people for the kind of disposition of heart, the type of mindset or attitude one would have to have to become a Christian and be a faithful child of God, that he said in Matthew chapter 18, and verse number 3. Matthew 18, 3 reads, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now we're asking the question, are we hereditarily totally depraved? Remember what we've already said about the definition and these other passages as to where our spirits come from. Well, now let me ask you, if the child is born totally depraved, and they so say he is, then we must become like it. Which is really a, a crazy thing, reasoning with their system, because you're born, according to them, hereditarily totally depraved. But Jesus said, except you become one of the little children, you can't enter the kingdom of God. But they're born and totally, totally depraved. So how does the person who was born and hereditarily, totally depraved follow the teaching of Jesus? Because you're already hereditarily, totally depraved. So how do you, can you become as little children? Because they were born just like you, having inherited Adam's original sin, and thus they're hereditarily, totally depraved. It makes no sense out of what Jesus is saying. There's no guidance in what Jesus is saying. It's so much double talk. Now, you want to ascribe that to Jesus? The truth of the matter is, he talks about the innocent child. Because people are not born hereditarily totally depraved. And we'll see more of that later. And the innocent child is just innocent. And our Lord's saying, to be converted as a grown-up who's accountable for your actions, you must become like this little child. Now, that makes sense. But it doesn't make sense if we're all born and totally, totally depraved. The little children would have been too, and you would be too, and that's just the way you are. So how is it you're going to turn and be like a little child? You're already like a little child because you were a little child one time, and you were born as an infant, hereditarily, totally depraved, having inherited Adam's original sin. That, as Campbell said one time about some false doctrine, it's just crazy at that point. And that's exactly what all false doctrine is when you understand it. Now, going further, they will say you're born that way. You had no choice in the matter. You just inherited the damnation and the hereditary, the total depravity. You just inherited it. But now watch this. In Romans chapter 3 and verse number 12, Romans 3, 12, Paul wrote this to the Lord's church in Rome in writing part of the New Testament. He says, they are all gone out of the way. They are together uh, become unprofitable. Now, did you get that? They've all gone out of the way. They have all become, or together they've become unprofitable. Now watch. Become unprofitable. But if hereditary total depravity is true, and when you're born in this world, you're born hereditarily totally depraved because you've inherited the original sin of Adam, thus you're inclined to no good thing at all. 
It's total. And you can't get more totaler than total. Then how is it that you become unprofitable? Become means here's one state when you're profitable, but you make a transformation and you become unprofitable. But if you're born in this world, having inherited the Adamic sin, thus you're totally depraved, how do you become totally depraved when you're already totally depraved? But the Holy Spirit through Paul in the New Testament of the Christ, I like to be the ought to know, says that you become unprofitable. And they've gone out of the way. Well, if you're in the way, that's the only way you can go out of the way. How do you go out of something you're not in? When we leave this building, we go out of the building. And that's because you're already in the building. And frankly, and I mean this very kindly, if you can't understand that, I don't think you have to worry about going to heaven. You'll go, period. Now you say, well, that seems awful smart of you to say that. Brethren, the Bible is a rational book. The Bible addresses man as God made man, an intellectual creature, and the way man comes to learn anything, and he's a rational creature. He can think. He can think, if you will. Now, you can think wrongly because you don't know how to think. And if you think total hereditary depravity is, is right, then you need to understand if you acknowledge the Bible to be the Word of God, there's a great... <laughs> conflict here between that doctrine and these simple plain bold passages thus surely we have the ability to know that if we go out of something we had to be in it first and that's just making it as plain as you ought to make it so if they are all gone out of the way how could they go out of if they weren't in it in the first place how could uh, they be together become unprofitable if they were already unprofitable, they would have to be profitable and then become unprofitable. But the false doctrine says when you're born in this world, you're depraved by inheritance. And you're inclined to no good thing at all. You're totally depraved. And you can't get any worse than that because you're as bad as you can be. And when you're as bad as you can be, you can't get any worse. Okay, now watch this from the Old Testament. Keeping in mind what we're studying. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18 and verse 20. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. And if you read the rest of the verse, it'll talk about the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Well, let's look at that a minute and think what we're talking about. Some affirm that we are hereditarily totally depraved. Remember whose offspring we are, and that speaks of our spirits. God's the father of our spirits. God gives us our spirits, and our spirits will return to him when our body goes back to the dust from which it was made. Jesus said you're to turn and become his little children or you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He said people weren't born out of the way. He said they've gone out of the way. He said they have become unprofitable, indicating strongly they were profitable first. Or the language doesn't make sense. And now we see the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. I, I think the scriptures surely convince us if, we are of the honest mind to be convinced that man is not holy, bad, evil, by inheritance, or by descent. Sin is a principle that exists only as the result of unlawful, unrighteous acts on man's part performed by one who has the power to discern right and wrong. Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3 and verse 4. It's the voluntary departure of a moral agent. Because he has the will to choose right and he has the will to choose wrong. And he chooses to depart from the truth. He departs from a moral rule. A duty God has laid upon him 
And God expects him to live that way. And he has a sense that says, I ought to do it. Because it's God's will. This is something prescribed by God. It's a voluntary transgression of the divine law or violation of a divine commandment. To depart voluntarily from the path of duty, which of course in the Bible is prescribed by God for all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, which means complete, Throughly or thoroughly furnished unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Then to depart voluntarily from the path of duty prescribed by God in the scriptures, as I just quoted, to violate the divine law in any particular. That's what sin is. That's what separates man from God. That's what will unforgiven cause men to enter into a devil's hell forever. And that's what, it, when you read about the great story of redemption, the power of sin is seen in the very power of God to overthrow it and what God had to do to destroy it. Not one single item of the definition I've just given can be received or transmitted by inheritance. Not at all. And that's what's being said in Ezekiel 18.20. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. We become sinners when we choose to sin. What is sin? Transgression of the law. When we know that God says, this is what you must do to be saved, this is what you must be uh, to live faithful Christian life, whatever, we have failed, we have sinned, we have chosen to do evil. Now we need a Redeemer. You know, let me say again that under a complete law system, once you violated it, there's no going back. Somebody says, well, you know, here's, here's a whole law system. Well, I only violated one, and I said I'm sorry, and I repent of that, and I wish I'd never done it. You don't understand a law system is the problem. If it's a pure law system, you violate any component part of it, that's the end of it. The only thing is to receive the punishment for doing it. But we're not saved by a pure law system. We all have sinned. We've already messed it up as far as a pure law system. But God's full of love and mercy and grace, so he provided the gospel system. It still involves obedience, but it doesn't involve absolutely flawless everything being totally in man's power to live a righteous life. You say, well, I don't understand that. All you got to do is look at Christ. He's the only one that ever did. Now, could you live like Christ? Being tempted in every point, you ever not sin? Of course not. Then I've got to have my faith, my confidence, my trust, my belief in one who did. Now, who was that? Who's the only one on this earth that can extend mercy by my belief and obedience to his will to save me? I cannot live a sinless life. Christ never transgressed God's law in thought, word, or action. He never omitted anything he ought to have done. And he did everything he ought to have done. I can't do that. And if he hadn't been able to do it, there'd be no salvation. There'd be no preaching of what I'm preaching right now. He's the only one that could take the pure, complete law system and never violate it. Once we violate it, the Bible says we have, and our own conscience tells us we have. If it's a pure law system, forget it. It's only the sentence of damnation. That awaits us. But God is a loving God. And God is full of grace and mercy. So he's ordained a system of grace. A system of mercy. The gospel system. The power of God to save us. That when I take the words of the truth. Which creates faith in God and Christ. And the system of salvation. That leads me to see my sinful condition. And desire from the heart to obey God. And thus I've repented of my sins. And the rest of my life, my mind, I'm going to do my best to do just exactly what the New Testament teaches. And I set my life in order to do it. And I confess my faith in Christ as my Savior. And I show Him by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to obtain the remission that He alone can give me. And when I do that, He adds me to the church. And therein, guess what? I'm covered by the blood of Christ as I walk in the light as He is in the light, having fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. 
I believe that. But I have to get to where the blood can be applied. So, the idea of an hereditary total depravity doesn't allow me to do any of that. I just have Adam's sin because I've inherited it. And I can't choose anything that's good because I'm not inclined to any good thing. Well, I think the Bible's good and the gospel's good, but I can't choose it. I'm so depraved. I can't do it. Now that leads to the next thing. You know the Bible teaches people are saved. Those who believe this doctrine know the Bible teaches that Christ is a Savior. But they have the view I've been setting out. How then do you take the scriptures that say that man can be saved, that Christ is a Savior, and then their loss can be saved and make it fit? Well, you just conclude there's nothing anybody can do in order to be saved. God, before the foundation of the world, said this class of people, they're saved. This class of people, they're lost. They don't have any choice in the matter. Because they were born having inherited Adam's original sin. They have no inclination to choose good at all. So they're just lost or saved. Well, those saved are those still have the Adamic sin. They're still separated from God. But the doctrine says nobody can do anything in order to be saved. Well, then how do you get those saved that the Lord before the world said would be saved whether they want to be saved or not? Oh, the Holy Spirit's got to come upon them and do for them what they never could do for themselves in destroying that endemic nature and that original sin. And then they have some sort of experience. They testify to the experience. Everybody else says, that sounds like me. The Holy Spirit worked on him. He's one of the elect, and we'll accept it. That's just exactly how it works in pure, pure Calvinism. I hesitate to use the word pure with it, but I mean by that, that's strict Calvinism. So, each thing regarding man's salvation, each thing we must believe, every step in the plan of salvation, is that which we're individually responsible to learn from the heart do, and we have the power to do it or not do it. That's what they will not acknowledge. Before we can be a sinner, either in the sight of God or man, you must have the power of reason. I don't know how it is you can justify a person being a rational person and believe Calvinism. There's no need to reason about anything. And how do you reason correctly when you're born having inherited Adam's original sin, thus you're inclined to no good thing at all, how could you reason correctly? You couldn't. You try to reason with somebody that does not have the power of reason for whatever reason and see how far you get. My daddy impressed that upon me many, many years ago. When my grandmother had really got so bad in her dementia that he told me later, he said, I tried to reason with her and it don't know me. That was the first mistake. You can't reason with an irrational person. You can't do it. Tell me how you'd reason with an irrational person. So there's not a soul on this earth that can be saved with their irrational and their, their irrationality. You may be responsible for going crazy. Once you've gone there, you may be beyond where you wanted to go. And you can't come back. It's the river of no return. Nevertheless, you put yourself there. Now, some people had problems, no, not their fault, that caused them to get in that state. Some people are just like the Pharisees and others, making difference what Jesus did. They won't believe on him. Well, they lost, aren't they? So there's not a soul on this earth that's going to go to heaven if they're not rational. You don't accidentally stumble into heaven. You have to choose heaven, and that means choosing to go to heaven God's way. That means understanding the Bible. It means understanding the gospel. And in doing so, you learn what God's done for man that man can do for himself. And then, lo and behold, you learn, I have a responsibility. I have to know something. I've got to show God I have faith in his system of salvation. And the only way you can do that is comply with his will. So despite one of, uh, deprive one of the power of reason, and you'll not have a person understanding even, even conceiving of right or wrong. How would you get somebody to understand right or wrong if they can't reason correctly? Go on and think about that. They are not held amenable to the law of God or man when they're in this boat if they're not responsible for going there themselves. They are not and cannot be subjects of the law as sin is the voluntary departure, as we said earlier, from the law. Now watch it. Since infants and idiots have no power to reason or will or desire to depart from the law, it follows that they cannot be sinners. That's what we mean by just innocent. They never reach the age of accountability to, to God. They, um, they are in a state of where they're not accountable. Thus, they're not in a state of being teachable. 
You can't communicate the way of salvation in the words of the gospel to them. If you want to try it, just take a two-year-old sitting down there and read the sermon in Acts chapter 2 to him. You say, you ready to obey that? Now, are you going to say, well, of course, I knew he wasn't anyways idiot. You wouldn't say that. I mean, he may be, but you wouldn't say that. But he's at a stage in growth and development where he's not prepared nor able to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save his soul. Because that involves understanding, being teachable. And when you've been taught to know what you've been taught and to learn right from wrong, seeing that you've been taught the gospel, you know anything contrary to the gospel is wrong. And then when you see the demands of the gospel on you to perform your part in being saved, you understand what to do. So to say that I'm a sinner by inheritance or that I was born a sinner, since sin is the transgression of the law, again, 1 John 3 and verse 4, well, that's to declare that I transgressed the law of God before I was born. Now, that's the most ridiculous thing you can hear, or at least one of them. Many don't know what's meant by inherited depravity. And for that reason, I said I, in the class earlier, I would read something directly from John Wesley and another man. In Wesley's Sermons, Volume 2, page 266, listen to one who believed in it and taught it. Listen to what he says about it. In Adam all died, all humankind, all the children of men who were in Adam's loins. The natural consequences of this is that everyone descended from him comes into the world spiritually dead, dead to God, wholly dead in sin, entirely void of the image of God, of all the righteousness and holiness wherein Adam was created. Instead of this, he says, every man born in the world now bears the image of the devil in pride and self-will, the image of the beast in sensual appetites and desires. Now you look at these little young'uns here, and you'll know why they're just little devils. You see, they act like they do because that's what they are. When they pitch a fit, why, wow, they're just as corrupt as they can be, having inherited Adam's original sin. Now, you can beat the fire out of them, hold them under water, as long as you don't hold them under too long, and they're still going to be those little devils. Well, that sure throws a monkey wrench into what Jesus said. <laughs> Except she turned, become as one of these little children, you'll know why they're the kingdom of heaven. Well, he should have said, except you turn and become these little devils. But he couldn't say that because they already were devils and he's trying to get them to change. But they can't change. They're inclined to no good thing at all. And you see the ridiculous and absurdity of this whole thing. Now, in his work on original sins, page 340, he says, We are condemned before we have done good or evil. Now, you think of that for a while. We're condemned before we've done good or evil under the curse ere we know what it is. That's why many of us have pointed out that Calvin's God is a monster. Before you ever know what's right, you're damned to a devil's hell. That's their view of the sovereignty of God. And that's the reason it's not the Bible view. Dr. W.A. Jarrell, a missionary Baptist, in his Gospel in Water, and you might get by that book why he's writing it because he does not like the powerful sermons gospel preachers have preached concerning the need of repenting and turning away from sin and being baptized. So he called it that. And you know, he probably learned more about that book after it was written because he had it quoted back to him multiplicity of times by gospel preachers in debate. He says that man is totally depraved is evident from his being a child of the devil. Now think about that for a minute. Fathered by the devil of the same moral nature. Pages 251-252. Now that's why you're like you are. <laughs> that's why I can't change you by preaching. You're just a bunch of devils. <laughs> well, you may be a bunch of devils, but it's because you would have chosen to do what the devil did. It wouldn't be because you inherited it. And that's the thing that they're saying. Now, <laughs> I'd rather... I think what we just read from these fellows is a pretty dark picture. But that's just it's what, what they mean. That's the reason it's dark. That's why man's in such a state when you believe this stuff of hereditary total depravity. Well, as sin is voluntarily transgression of the law, if the child is born wholly corrupt, since one cannot be wholly corrupt till they have violated every law of, of right, 
Then, this ungodly theory teaches that an unborn infant has violated every known law of right. I think they ought to be aborted. Don't sh shudder at this. It, it, it proves even more. If what was true about, if, if, if this doctrine is true, it changes a lot of things. I don't know why parents even want to have children. But of course, they're inclined to no good thing at all. So they just keep having these little devils. A child cannot inherit from its parents property they do not possess. Think about that. Is that a profound statement or just simple? You can't inherit what's not there. And if you're inheriting from your parents and it's not there, you haven't got anything to inherit. Unless it's like the man I heard about one time who says, I've given the best inheritance through my will to my son if I can have. I've willed him the wide, wide world. The child at least, the child at least inherits its physical organism from its earthly parents. Now listen to what the Holy Spirit had to say on this. The works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Then he goes ahead to say, They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Shall not what? Shall not inherit, as I word, the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19-21. But you have the choice to do or not do those things. And Paul's whole letter is saying, as a member of the church, a Christian, remove yourself from them. Well, that implies you've got the will to stop it. You know, really, when you repent, it means I've stopped it. It's not just saying I'm sorry, and I'll just keep drifting right along. To genuinely repent means I quit. I stop. Now, these sins are works of the flesh, and the parent gives the child its physical organism. If the child is born totally depraved, since parents cannot give to the child that which they do not possess, then the parents must possess the above sins. That is the sins of Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And you know, they must have an extra supply of them because whether they have one child or 15, they just keep giving those whole things to all of them. So they've got enough to pass it on to whether it's one or 40. Now let's look just for a moment at one or two of the passages that are relied on by these people to prove that children are born totally depraved. One of them is found in even the New, uh, the, uh, New International Version, where they didn't translate. They read into it and they put into it their own false doctrine. Psalm 51, 5. Behold, King James says, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now consider with me. I'll read it again. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Remember, David had no existence before conception. The iniquity existed when he was shapen, and the sin existed when he was conceived. As he had no existence before his conception, and as he existed at the time of his conception, we cannot fail to see that the sin existed before David had an existence, even by conception. There is no intimation in this passage that David was born a sinner, as they like to quote it to try to prove, or that he had a sinful nature. What David's talking about is what was going on before his conception and was going on when he was conceived. It has nothing to do with him in the womb. And yet the New International Version translated it as the doctrine teaches, because they see in that passage according to their theology, so how can they translate it except to put it the way they think it is? But it's not translation, folks. It's putting in to the passage false doctrine. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies, Psalm 58.3. Let me read it again. This will be a proof text to say that little... Children or babies are born in sin, having inherited Adam's original sin. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Well, this declares that they were not born astray. It doesn't say that. That's what they read it to want you to think. It doesn't say that. They went astray after birth. That's what it says. This going astray was speaking lies. 
or lie. I have yet to see a child, as soon as it takes its first breath, start lying. And yet, it has to say that for them to uphold the doctrine of hereditary total depravity. As lying is sin, and sin is voluntarily de departing from the law of God, then when they went astray, guess what? They were old enough to exercise their free will to voluntarily depart from the law of God, which implies they knew it and gave it up. Now, this passage doesn't teach anything about that. Voluntary, uh, willing, proceeding from the free will is what it means. Of their own free will, they spoke lies. Thus, they became sinners. But they had to get old enough to understand the law, to know what it meant, and to choose to go beyond it. Now, there's never been the most high IQ newborn baby in the world that could do that. It is just simply how far people will go to try to find a passage to justify a false doctrine. Rather than to be honest, Luke 8, 15, receive their sins, repent of them, and turn to the truth of the gospel and become a Christian, as we've studied already this morning. Now, if you're a child of God and you have voluntarily sinned as a child of God, he has a second law of pardon. You must repent of that sin and confess it to God and ask God to forgive you. If it's a public sin, then you need to take care of it as you publicly committed it. And you need to confess it and we'll pray with you and for you and God will hear. But to become a Christian, you must choose God's way of salvation. His free salvation given to you that you can't earn. But you have to wait, have a way to receive it. Now, how do you do that? From the heart, you obey the gospel. And that involves being baptized into Christ, having believed in and repented of your sins, confess your faith in Him as the Son of God. Now you're qualified scripturally to complete your obedience of being immersed into Christ by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to become a Christian. No, you haven't inherited any kind of sin like that. That's a figment of somebody's twisted imagination. And it ought to be given up and given back to the devil where it came from. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.